Hey, this is Malika for Evanston Live TV, the voice of the people. I just had an amazing interview with a phenomenal woman, the first female black mayor of Evanston, <laughs> Lorraine Morton. Uh, I could have sat with her for hours, just absolutely love her. Uh, she's just a wealth of knowledge and wisdom, so I can't wait for you all to check it out. Uh, celebrating Black History Month, we're kicking off Black Evanston for the month of February. Well, always. <laughs> so you guys check out this episode and stay tuned for much, much more. Hi, Malika, come in, come in, Hi, come Ms. in. Martin. Hi, How are you? I'm fine, and how are you? <laughs> great, great. Oh, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> yes, this is Thanks wonderful. Thanks for having us. Let's come on in. <laughs> yes, let me close this door because the weather's cold. <laughs> oh, well, come on in. All right. Um, gee. And um, Ms. Morton, I mean, you, when people see you around Evanston, you get instant respect. And people are like, that's Ms. Morton. It's almost like you're still the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, you're right. <laughs> Many people do call, still call me mayor. And I used to really feel so embarrassed because I said, I'm not the mayor. Now, and it was just such a, it was, it was really kind of traumatic with me, really, because I felt maybe, you know, I was intruding on somebody else's territory. But my daughter finally told me, she said, Mama, you stop feeling bad about that. She said, because you know everybody, you have a relationship with the people, and when they still call you mayor, it's out of respect. And you know, since then, I thought about it. I said, she's correct. So now I just smile and am thankful when they remember me because <laughs> that's been a long time and I've been around a long, long time. <laughs> well, Ms. Morton, give, give us a little bit of, of how you just came to be so strong because, I mean, you enter a room and people sit down and talk to you and just this fire, this strength just exudes from you. Where, where did all of that come from? Because I've been around so long and I know everybody. <laughs> Actually, you, you, really, uh, you know, when I came to Evanston in 1953, my husband and I came to this house, which is over 100 years old now, believe it or not, and um, went right to work. I came here in August, went right to work at Foster School. Well, and I got to know those children and their parents and grandparents. And then I w taught, I went over to uh, Nichols. I think you may know about that, to, to integrate the teaching staff. Uh, because um, at, when I came here, like, all of the black teachers that they had, uh, they had maybe about five, I were working at Foster School. But when I came, I had no idea that this was a school that was really, to where teachers were relegated to a segregated position. But nevertheless, I just went ahead and went to work. Okay, then from there, the, but that brought me into the black community. And I got to know everybody, joined the club, which is great. And then over at Nichols, it was a successful thing. I enjoyed it, uh, being the first black to integrate the teaching staff of school district 65 was no problem because I had come here from Tuskegee teaching in a, a, a laboratory school at uh, Tuskegee Institute's Children's House which was their laboratory school. So it was, it was very well, it went well. I, I read her. And then from there, so that was a population and that was a, a different section of Edison. So I got to know those kids their parents and grandparents. And then from there, they sent me to Chute School, and it, which was just opening, and I was happy to be there. And again, another group of young children and their parents and grandparents, I got to know them. 
and then from there to Haven. Another group of children, another group of parents. Then I was an alderman of the fifth ward. I got to know the ward people. And then from there to mayor. And I had an opportunity to meet the downtown section of Evanston and, and the people who work there. And, and you know, when you're an alderman and, and when you're a, also a mayor, the job just requires you to, to meet people. So that's what has That's why I know so many people. <laughs> and, oh, but I have to tell you this. I think one of the things, and this is just Lorraine, I really enjoy talking with people. I don't get angry with them if they disagree with me, as long as it isn't personal. Now, if it's personal, you know, then that's a different thing. But as long as the, the, the whatever the matter is, uh, uh, is purely something outside of my personal life. And frankly, tell you the truth, in all of my years of being here, I don't remember but one person, just one, that I feel was an injustice to me. Everybody else, I think, has been okay. So that's how I know everybody. So when I go out, I go to Food for Less, Nav Valley, wherever, and I see people, well, I stop and talk. And because they want to talk, and uh, we have things to reminisce about, or, you know, or they want to know what are you doing, because all of them know that I've been around a long time. And I talk, and I talk, and I talk. And then wherever I'm out, who not care where I go, somebody there will know I will know. <laughs> so my daughter tells me that my shopping is my social hour. <laughs> I can never say, oh, I'm going to go to the store, it's 10 o'clock, I have to be back home by 10.30. That usually doesn't happen because I'm talking, and I, I'm enjoying it. I enjoy talking with them, and I, I'm so happy that uh, people are willing to take their time to talk and for us to reminisce and share whatever we know and whatnot. And then on top of that, Alenka, I have young folks who come to see me, like you, mm -hmm. loads of them. They come in for whatever it is, that whatever the problem is, because they know I'm not going to share it. Uh, I'm going to do what I can to, to help them out. And that's a, the greatest joy of my life, dealing with these young people. The mm -hmm. thing about it is, you know, sometimes young people think that when they're going to talk to older people, that you're going to be so judgmental, but that I'm, I'm, I'm not that. <laughs> you know, all I want to do is uh, enjoy having a conversation and see how I can help. And that's just me. Wow. Okay. And the election here in Evanston has been pretty intense, and you just make it sound so easy. Oh, I was alderman, then I was mayor. <laughs> uh, what what is your advice to these candidates? Because uh, I attended the hearing, yeah. uh, all the days, and it was it was. I mean, has anything like that ever happened in Evanston? No, no. Ooh. I've never, as long as I've been here, I have never witnessed an election like I'm seeing now in Evanston, where things are going on and. Oh, saying things about people. I don't know why they do that. But I don't think it's it's a good thing. And, you know, it's bad enough to have had a presidential election that has upset the whole country. And then to be here in my own city and to see some adversarial relationships, I, I'm very sorry about that. What's but I will say this, okay. you know, young people, many of them who have achieved much in life, 
didn't grow up in homes where parents talked about the negative side of life. There are things they know nothing about. They know nothing about people who deceive them. They know nothing about people who lie. They know nothing about that. And it's only when they get out into the world, or maybe get on their first job, that they learn that everybody is not as nice as they think they are, or as they think they were when they were, when when you were kids. Now, why do I say that? Because that's what happened to me. <laughs> I didn't know that people would lie. Mm -hmm. You know, I I I I never knew that. I know to get into a classroom, uh, into a a situation, and you see these people talking, and I learned that. What first? No, but my first time of learning it was when I was in high high school. The second time when I saw, I mean, these are things that had an impact on me, was uh, my first teaching job, and. But you know that's I, that's just one of those things. But I do, and I've seen it with my grandchildren. But after you learn that, you get your, you finally learn that these things can happen. You're much the wiser in your relationship with other people. So I think probably it's a good thing <laughs> that your kids grew up kind of isolated from the from the bad things in the world. But that does not prepare them for the real world that they're going to get into uh, when they get older. Mm -hmm. and, and what's your advice on handling those that deceive? Because the political world is, it's a, it's a pretty intense game. And just being in business and being a woman and being a black woman, how do you handle the snake pit? <laughs> how do you handle that? Well, you know, if you make your life always, always adhering to what you see in the segregated system, and you let those things in, get in your way, of maximizing your talents, you're crazy. You know it, you recognize it, and you move on. Uh, you can't on your own, but certain things uh, you, you can deal with in a very nice professional way, if it's a personal thing. But uh, you, you're really making a major mistake that every time you're out and you say, oh my God, this is happening to me. Therefore, I am going to go home and fume over it. That's a mistake. You use it as something, as a, take it as a learning experience <laughs> and move on and maximize your talents and do whatever you want to do in life that will make your life better. Now, you can't control what people do. You can't control what people say. But you can control what you do. And you can control what you say. If saying something doesn't further uh, a, a really magnificent purpose for you, leave it alone. <laughs> doesn't mean you <laughs> like it or anything else. But you must self-actualize. You must plan a way to get ahead in your life. Now, wait a minute. Don't misunderstand me. I don't think that there are not situations that deal with race and equalities and what have you that come your way that you should not address. But it's how you do it. It depends. On, I'll give you one example. I was out with a friend of mine at a restaurant, and this friend saw two people she knew, I won't identify them, but they, that she knew, she said, oh, Lorraine, I'd like for you to meet them. 
So after we finished eating, we went over. Uh, there were two gentlemen there. One of the gentlemen knew her. Both of the men knew her. They didn't know me, but they knew her. One of the gentlemen stood up. And, How are you? And you know all the nice amenities that you would expect. And then the other gentleman remained seated, which didn't really bother me. And so, like I would do, I shook, stood my hand out to shake his hand. He gave me his left hand. You know, I didn't say anything for a while. I went on with the conversation, nice professional conversation. But I said to myself, I can't let this pass. To me, this is a personal affront. So I very professionally, I don't remember my words, but it was a very professional language. And I said, you know, uh, when I shook hands with me, you put out your left hand. I'm really not accustomed to that. So let me have your right hand and let me shake your right hand. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean by, you know, you address some things, but it's how you do it. I'm sure that man will never forget <laughs> and I'll bet he will never do that again uh, to anyone, you know? <laughs> I didn't get mad with her. I just did what I thought. I, I, but I couldn't let it go. I couldn't let that go. To me, that was a personal affront. Uh, the, my friend who was with me was very much upset because he didn't stand up. Really, I wasn't as much upset about that. But I was upset about that left hand. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand getting given a left hand if your hand is so are you, you know, you're in an awkward position. You're eating and you have a piece of bread in your hand. You know, I can understand that I would not address but he didn't have anything in his hand. <laughs> you know, yeah. Oh, Miss Martin, so you handle everything with class, I can I can tell. That's probably why you get so much respect because of how you respond to things. Yes, I try to be mm -hmm. uh, you know. As professional as, as as you can be, but you know, um, I don't think that our young people should allow uh, situations in which they are, you know, what I would call a racial situation. Should dwell on those to the extent that they forget what their mission in life is. I, I just don't think they should. Uh, you, uh, uh, you recognize it, just like in all black males, you don't know what they go through. When they get in an interracial world, they have to always remember they are black. They, have to, they may talk to me and put their hands on my arm and just say, oh, you know, glad to see you. But if that person is white and he's a black man, he can't do the same thing to her that doesn't mean, because then someone said he's being, you know, you, I don't have to relay that to you. Mm -hmm. But um, you don't let them get in your way of making progress. And as the more you, you uh, perseverate on a goal for yourself in life. Prepare yourself for that goal you have. You'll have a good life. And what, what are your thoughts on Evanston becoming uh, the welcoming city? I attended uh, that last council meeting where really? they confirmed it and you know there were a few people that were like well a welcoming city that means we're condoning illegal activity and then others are like, you know, everyone should be able to live, you know, where they want, where they feel safe and where they can prosper. Now, when you say that you don't want certain people to come into our city, that is a form of segregation. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't care what you want to say about it. You can call it anything you else, else you want to call it. But that is a form of segregation. Now, let me tell you something else I've, I've, I've thought about it all over the country, all over the world, where they're uh, talking about taking people from Syria and what have you. All right, when those people come into your community, 
what is wrong with them bringing whatever culture that they have? Now, we don't, now here in Evanston, we don't complain about anybody who's Catholic, who's Baptist, who's Episcopalian, who is Methodist, Muslim. We don't complain about anything because we have had a history, uh, not always, but, but certainly uh, back uh, early in the, in the 1900s, of being a city proud of its diversity. And over the years, more and more and more and more people of, of, of different nation, races and nationalities have been assimilated into all aspects of our community. Uh, our school system has been responsive to children who've come from other countries and don't speak our language. Now, I'm not telling you what somebody else said, I don't know what Lorraine knows herself. Because I can remember the days when, before they had the, you know, now they've really uh, made a big deal out of it. They have teachers who uh, have nothing to do but uh, take the kids who speak this another language and work with them on a small basis. Uh, that wasn't always in, in, in the school district 65. It, it wasn't as defined as it is now. But they had it when I came here in 1953. There was some of it going on, and uh, that I know. It was, but it, the, it, it, it wasn't a good thing because it wasn't well defined. It, the kids had to get into the classroom with a teacher very much aware of the language difficulty with help with that child. But now, as you, you, you know, it's very different from that. It's very good. So the history, and let me tell you what else. I don't think people ever think about this. Do they realize that this community was so welcoming that they hired, I mean, elected, a black woman to be the mayor of the city and did it four times? And you, what does that say about our community? It says something wonderful about Evanston. It doesn't say that people are pointing their fingers at this and that and the other that's negative. They're saying we don't care what she is, as long as she's qualified, you know. And I think to anyone who would not want to bring people into this community from foreign countries is making a mistake. That to me is a form of prejudice. And Ms. Morton, okay, getting off of uh, politics and community, just woman to woman, I want to ask you about Love. About love. <laughs> love. Oh, no, that's great. <laughs> that's very important. <laughs> How were you able to balance being such an influential woman in the community? And so and I, I imagine you were super busy because you're busy now. <laughs> yeah. so I can imagine then when you were responsible for so much and then you know, having a family, how were you able to balance all of that? Well, I never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I just never thought of it that way. I've always just been Lorraine. And uh, I think I've been Lorraine, you know, all of my life and my family. I guess let me grow up to be Lorraine. Uh, I know my father before he died and all of us had come home to be with Papa. We knew he was leaving us. And um, my sister had moved his bedroom uh, downstairs in the dining where the dining room was, taking the dining room furniture out and put the bedroom furniture in there. 
and we were all home and we were eating dinner. And so we, some of us took our plates and went in the dining room uh, with Papa to, you know, sit there. And of course, when um, dinner was over, before, I guess a little before it was old, Papa was talking. All, Papa was always giving us advice. And uh, all of them left Papa except me. So one of the girls, came, my sisters came in and said, Papa, Lorraine is up to her old tricks. Says so time now to wash the dishes and she stayed in here talking to you. <laughs> For the first time in my life I found, saw my daddy show a preference. Or one child over another it was absolutely, it startled me. I'd never seen him. He said, Go on and leave Lorraine alone. And my father spent his time telling me how to live. And one of the things that he said was, and gave me examples of his life and what he had done, and I didn't know about that. He told me, Only a life of service is a life worthwhile. And you know, I got that message. And I know that my father meant for me to really get that message because, you know, you have to have compassion for people. And maybe compassion is learned. Uh, you know, I don't know. I know I learned it from Papa. And I'm so glad, you know, that I did. I did. People are hungry. You don't know. I, I was telling someone the other day, you don't know what hunger is until you see a, a child crying because he's hungry. And I'm a young teacher in my class. This was in Winston-Salem, my second year teaching school. And we had homerooms. I had a little boy and a kid in my homeroom. Some of the kids came and told me, said, Miss Harrister, my maiden name, <laughs> uh, Whatever the kid's name was, I don't remember that name. Said he's been crying all day. I said, Well, what's wrong with him? And they said, Well, he won't tell us what's wrong with him. I said, Okay. So then I wanted to know where was he? What where you know that he changed classes? Where was he? And the kid told me. Some kid told me. So I sent for this little boy. So when he came in, I had another class, but I came outside my class into the hallway to talk to him. And I said, I hear you've been crying all day. What's the matter? That kid's face went up. He said, I'm hungry. Oh, did that touch my heart. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you haven't had anything to eat? No, he had not had anything to eat. I said, well, do you have any sisters and brothers? He said, well, I have a, a sister who is in first grade, who is down on the first floor of the school. I said, well, when school is out, bring her upstairs here with me, which he did. And I took him home, and I bought him some food. Bro. Went in that house. Went in the house was as clean. As, it was so really so clean you could almost eat off the floor. Went into the kitchen, and I opened up the cabinets. His mother wasn't there. There was ap that wasn't even a box of salt, mm -hmm. nothing in that house for those kids. And on the stove was a big pot, and it looked as though someone had taken his or her finger and gone around it to get out all they could get out of that pot. Do you th not think that that had a major impact on me? Mm -hmm. To see a child cry like that? Tune up his little face and just said, I'm hungry. And I never I didn't ask him how long he'd been without food. I just I had to put him on the bus and, and because at that time they didn't have busing. And I took him home. But those are the kind of experiences that have an impact on you and I think helps you to understand when people talk about people being hungry, I don't I don't have any doubt, I know what it's like. You learn from your experiences. I don't know what I say learn. I say you're affected by uh, your experiences in life. And of course I have many others I can tell you, but I'm just sharing this. Because in the world today, there's so much 
hunger. In the world today, the populations of, of many cities, not just Evanston, we all we bring into Evanston many people who come here because of the school system, who come here because of the universities, and we had more than one at one time, and. Uh, so you're bringing into Evanston a diversity. Now I have to say that those who are coming to work for the university, they are of a different economic status. But they are new to the way of life that we have here in Evanston. And I have not heard a one say they didn't like it. And not one. In fact, the other night, at the affair where you were, uh, someone came up to me who had been a former student when I was principal at Haven. And she and her husband had moved away. She said, but you know, Ms. Morton, we moved back to Evanston because they realized that Evanston is a little mecca of human I, I guess I don't say human, which the identification of the human problems and doing something about it. We have more agencies here that are have as their mission to help somebody. We have, I think, one time, uh, some time ago, I had counted eighty. Now, how many we have today, I, I really don't know. But the churches help people. Different community organizations help people. Northwestern gives to these uh, organizations we have here that are doing things to help people who are, are, are in need. We have organizations designed to help seniors, not only to do, to provide uh, 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 places for uh, 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 to at least to try to find places for our seniors uh, to get the best care that they possibly can get and for those who are staying at home to get help in the home I think sometimes someone should just write a little list of all of the things that are done here in Evanston to help somebody and Pumba is right only a life of service is a life worthwhile. I would add one other thing to Papa's message. Only a life of service gives you great door and great respect that you're living. Thank you so much, Miss Morton. Thank you, thank you.